she literally grabbed my son, and began to run. You found the best place, for your vengeful needs. Imagine doing groceries with your kid, and an entitled Karen decides that your kid, is actually not yours anymore. And then also calls dips. I present to you, Snatchy Karen. Enter an entitled Karen, who sets a new record in pissing people off and wasting everybody's time, while suing a special education school for slander. She wins a battle, but loses the war. All that can be said for the last story is, hippity hoppity, she damaged the property. Bippity boppity, I'm calling the copity. Bippity boppity boo, they're taking her kids too. Whenever a Karen demands to see the manager, be sure to offer them the like button instead. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts, might be disturbing to entitled Karens. So this happened about a week ago and I honestly am still fuming from this. First a little backstory. I'm a mixed ethnicity individual. I've been confused for many races over the course of my 29 years on this planet, but I'm literally Caucasian and African American. Usually it can be figured out, but the difference with me is that my father is the Caucasian, so therefore my hair is straight. I'm originally from Texas and am usually confused for being Mexican. But now I live in Massachusetts, I've never had an issue with anyone concerning my race, until this day. Also, I am married to a Caucasian woman who had a child before we were married. His father is not in his life as much and I took the responsibility because I love this woman, and I love this little kid as if he were my own. He's four now and I've been in his life since he was one. Anyways on to the story. My wife needed a few things from the grocery store and she needed to run a few more errands. Usually she just goes and knocks things out herself because I'm sleeping, I work nights, but this particular day I happened to be awake and I offered to go for her. She works hard and does a lot, so I definitely felt it was necessary to do something for her so she could just relax for the day. I took my son with me so she could rest up and just take it easy, and it gave me time to spend with my son for some bonding. We completed all of the errands which went smoothly, and then headed to the grocery store to finish up our day. My son, being a typical four-year-old, was full of energy running ahead of me laughing and speaking to everyone he comes across, which I generally don't mind as long as he doesn't hit anyone and stays within eye view. As I'm making my way down and I'm looking for canned corn, my son jogs to the end of it when an older lady is entering at the other end. My son being the sweet social butterfly he is, approached and exclaims and excited. Hi, me four, and me Ryan. Bless his little heart. The lady looked down and says. Well hello there. You shouldn't be running around unattended, let's go find your parents. I didn't think anything of her statement because I assumed she just hadn't seen me. Ryan. Come back here bud, please. He excitedly runs back toward me and starts turning in circles because you know, he's four. I'm still searching the shelves as the lady walks past me and stops behind me. Again, I think nothing of it, because it's a grocery store and you have to share the aisles. I turn my basket around and start to walk toward the front cash registers when this lady literally blocks my path. I say excuse me, and try to walk around her and she moves her cart in front of me again. I honestly thought she was just getting confused and said excuse me once again, and tried one more time to go around, and she just blocks my path again. The following convo ensues. Um, sorry about that, we'll get out of your way. No, I don't think so. You're not going anywhere with that child. You mean my son? That's not your child. He's white. And you're Mexican. You probably didn't even know his name until he said it to me. Sure whatever lady, can you just move? My wife is at home and anxiously awaiting for us. Stop your lies. You're not taking him anywhere, you perv. This whole time my son is standing close to me holding my leg because he was honestly getting scared. I was getting angry, because I hadn't had much sleep and I have a short fuse anyway, thanks dad. I told her, as you can see, he's standing close to me because he trusts me and you're scaring him so how about you buzz off? No. He's scared because of you. He just doesn't know how to express it yet. She looks at my son. Come on now sweetie, I'm here to rescue you. Come with me. Thankfully, my son was able to communicate to her he wasn't going anywhere with her. But she was having none of it. She literally grabbed my son, and began to run. It caught me off guard, because I honestly could not fathom what was actually happening. 
My son starts screaming loudly because he was so scared and this lady is just like. Don't worry sweetie he won't hurt you I promise. Suddenly I snap back into reality and I begin to chase after this crazy winch. While running through the store, I yell for people to stop her and that she's kidnapping my son and thankfully a worker stops her before she makes the exit. Why are you stopping me? This Mexican here is trying to kidnap my grandson. My son literally is bawling his eyes out, extending his arms out calling for me. This lady was relentless and would not let go of my son, even after he slaps her face multiple times. I laughed a little not gonna lie. At this point a manager shows up and asks what's going on. The lady spoke before me while pointing at me. This pervert is trying to kidnap my grandson, and I was just trying to escape. That's my son you freaking psycho. Now let him go. The manager didn't know what to believe. I don't blame him, he was caught in a weird situation. So I pulled out my phone and showed him pictures of me and my son, that dated a year or so back as proof. This lady still would not give up and accused me of faking them. Like how would you do that exactly? I'll never know but whatever. Sadly, there were two other ladies there taking the psycho's side and said I was attempting to kidnap my own son, because there was no way we were family because of our different skin tones. One even called the police, which I was actually happy about, because I knew they'd be able to review the security cameras. Even still, I called my wife to see if she could come to the store to get this situation cleared up quicker. As soon I told her what was going on, she zoomed to the store. She got there about the same time as the police. The crazy ladies were giving their statement to the cops when my wife walked in. As soon as she walked in, my son goes, Mama, help. My wife is a true mama bear, and she immediately flew into a rage when she saw this lady holding my son. Let him go, now. Sorry sweetie I was just trying to protect him from this pervert over here. Yeah we saw him trying to kidnap him, but this lady saved him. The cop looks at the lady and is confused. I thought this was your grandson? My wife said she had no idea who that lady was. She takes out her phone and shows the officer a picture of my mother-in-law. Okay, I'm sorry, he's not my grandson, but I was only trying to protect him from this dirty pervert over here. Yeah I witnessed the whole thing, he snatched that child and tried to run away with him, but this lady stopped it. Yes I saw it too. He needs to be arrested. And you should be thankful that this lady was here to save your son, because you obviously just let him loose wherever. Who are you talking about again? All three crazy ladies pointed at me. Oh, you mean my husband? Husband? Yeah, who do you think called me and got me here so fast? I presented my ID to the officer and the manager, and my wife did the same. We also each showed pictures of us on our phones, to prove we were really a family. The cop nodded in approval and handed us our phones back and jotted down a few notes. The three ladies for some reason, still kept trying to say this was all fake and my wife was in on the kidnapping, and said we needed to be arrested. My wife lost it at this point and let off some colorful words I won't repeat here, but she definitely got her point across. Then the nail in the coffin came for the psycho trio. The officer turned to the manager and asks. Sir, do the cameras work here? Yes. We have them inside and out. Okay great, let's go review. The three ladies' faces went pale. Like ghostly pale. The officer reviewed the outside camera as I pulled into the parking lot, and saw me take my son out of my car, and then as I went up and down the aisles and most importantly, the instance the woman snatched up my son, and began to run. Upon his return he asks. Would you like to press charges? Yes, I would. Why would I be asking you that question? Shut your mouth and sit down. He turns to me and repeats the question. So I said, absolutely. Lady 1 was charged with attempted kidnapping, false imprisonment, providing a false police report and child endangerment. The other two were also charged with providing a false police report as well. To make matters worse for Lady 1, my son bruises easily and she left some terrible spots on him from where she was grasping him, but he's fine. This added a charge of child abuse to her rap sheet. I have court later this year but I'm not sure when because of you know what going around now. The officer will be following up with me in a few weeks. To everyone whom has commented and shown support, thank you. I tried my best to respond to you all but the messages came through so fast and I couldn't keep up. I posted this to vent my experience and get it off my chest. I kinda went off grid, sorry for that. But I have a real update to share. 
Apparently the lady involved is trying to be real quiet and drag this out as much as possible. But we have managed to get a court date in October. No date exactly yet. But trust me, I'll post as soon as I have more info. This story is a bit of malicious compliance, with a lot of ongoing revenge, so I chose to share it. Second, this story involves legal issues, so names and identifying details were changed. And now for the fun part, this story if about 5 years old, and some of it, as you will read in the end, is still rolling and will probably for a long time. It starts with Mrs. P, as principal, because that's what she is. Mrs. P started as a special needs kids caretaker, study through the years of work, and graduated a doctorate in special education. After 20 years of experience in this, she was asked by the council of a medium-sized city, to open and run a new special needs school in the city. She accepted the offer, and after four years she had a school with 150 kids in it. For a special education school, that's a huge number. Such schools need way more people than a regular school does, not just teachers, but also other caretakers, and the job isn't always clean and easy. So naturally Mrs. P is always looking to hire. Enter the subject, here comes Karen. Karen just finished her college, and got a degree in education consulting top of her class. Her professor was on Mrs. P school board, and she recommended her with very warm words, Karen was basically hired before she even sent her resume. Karen is married to Kevin, of course, who finished his law studies top 5 in his class, and now doing his internship in a big law firm, awaiting his license to practice the law. Basically, their future is laid bright and clear, all they have to do is not F up, on the path to a nice, wealthy life. Mrs. P accepted Karen to work in the school, and announced to her that she will start working on the 20th of August, about a week before the school year starts, as the staff needs to organize the school for the opening of the school year. Karen protests that she is a consultant, not another low life that comes to mop the floor. Mrs. P stunned and pissed by this attitude. But Karen is top of her class and supposedly the best in the field, so she just smiles and said, Staff starts to work on August the 20th, you are staff too, so be here on that date. Karen isn't happy, but well, that's life. That pre-opening week, would be something that the staff would never forget. As first impressions are powerful. While teachers and nurses and other members work together hard, to get the school up to shape, including painting the walls, setting equipment, and other chores you don't learn in college, Karen fixed her own room, sat in it all day and played with her phone. Needless to say, she wasn't very popular among school staff. But time went on, school opened on time, and things started to get into their regular routine. Karen was causing more and more issues. She refused to fill in regular reports about her activities, was not available to meetings with staff and parents, and all in all, was a total entitled Karen. Mrs. P tried to talk to her again and again, to no avail, Eventually Mrs. P asked the professor, the one who gave Karen her degree, the one who was on the school's board, to sit with Karen daily and coach her, on how to actually work and function in a real school environment, as apparently she didn't learn that in college. But even that didn't help. Karen was hated by all the school staff, and her work was done poorly and getting worse every week. Mrs. P had a meeting with Karen and the professor every week, to discuss her performance and how to do better. Meanwhile, Important reports and other documents were not filled, and the care to the children was getting worse every day. Until eventually, a parent filed a complaint about the poor treatment his child got, and the board became aware of the issues. A meeting was set with the board, Mrs. P and Karen. The professor promised Karen, that if she just gets her paperwork in order and acts respectfully, she would be alright. Karen knew she was on the hook now, but just couldn't stop being a Karen. So the day of the meeting comes, and Karen is a no-show, no-call. She just didn't come that day, and the day after, and the week after. Without Karen, the board could only listen to what Mrs. P has to say, but they already knew it, so the meeting was delayed to a time when Karen would show up. Needless to say, this doesn't help her case at all. Anyway, Mrs. P and the professor tried to get Karen on the phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Eventually Mrs. P had no choice, Karen is a no-show no-call, for over a week, she has to have a really good explanation to not get fired now. She calls Karen and leaves a message in her voicemail, that she hadn't heard from her in over a week, she is very worried, and please be in contact ASAP as finance want to cut her pay. Finally Karen called in. She had been sick the whole time. But she will return to work in two days. Good, 
Mrs. P marks the date and sets a meeting with the professor and Karen first thing in the morning. If Karen is actually ill and has a doctor's note, she won't be fired, but she will receive strong words about the no-call issue. The day arrives, Mrs. P and the professor sit in her office, waiting for Karen to arrive. She didn't come. Mrs. P tries to call her and gets the voicemail, again. She is pissed, the professor is pissed, and Karen has set a new record in pissing people off and wasting everybody's time. Karen shows up two hours late, and before anything else, Mrs. P calls her in for a meeting immediately. She calls for the professor to come, the professor cancelled other plans she had to come in, and the meeting finally starts three hours late. Thankfully, Karen had a doctor's note, she is okay on that, but she is going to get the strong words now. About 10 minutes into the meeting, Karen burst in tears. The meeting is stopped to cool things down, but it's not over yet. After a few minutes, everybody comes back into the room and Karen opens with. I am still not okay, I still feel sick, I want to go home now. Mrs. P is silent, and the professor comments. As a board member I must tell you this. As long as you are sick your job is safe, but it is your first year. You have not saved anything in sick days or vacation days. You will not be paid for this. Karen just replied with. We'll see about that. She then collected her things and left. Karen is sick for another two weeks, and her position is vacant. Mrs. P does what she can to fill the void, as do others, but it's clear that a position is empty and it needs to be filled. Eventually, Mrs. P calls Karen again to ask how she is doing and when she'll be back. Then Karen says she can't handle the pressure and wants to quit. Mrs. P is stunned by this. Karen is only in her first year, quitting in the middle will risk her future, and finding another consultant in the middle of school year is almost impossible. But she keeps her thoughts to herself, and just said she doesn't think it's necessary nor wise. She tells Karen to just feel better soon and come back at that point. But Karen doesn't come back, and after two more weeks of absence, her husband called in to ask. Why, has there not been a salary deposit yet? He gets the obvious answer, Karen has no right to paid sick leave, he gets angry and promises to check his options, which in lawyer's terms is, I want to sue you. Now it's clear that the bridge was burned and Karen won't be back. Mrs. P started looking for a much needed replacement, and the options aren't great. Eventually she convinced a retired consultant to come back from retirement, just to save this year. The replacement starts working, but can't get paid, the position is still officially occupied by Karen, who is still on sick leave. Board members are now calling Karen, as it's clear she will not talk to Mrs. P. They ask her to come back, and when she refuses, they ask her to submit her resignation to allow them to keep the school running. Karen then claims she is ready to come back, only if she will be paid for all her sick leave, but nobody's willing to pay that. The mess is growing bigger and bigger, the parents start to hear rumors, and overall climate is not very good. Until finally Kevin, Karen's husband, calls in and says he wants to sue the school for the payment. He gets to talk to the city lawyers, who explain to him that Karen cannot sue the school or the city while she is still sick or still registered as an employee, she has to stop one of these conditions. The day after, Karen is at school with a standard resignation letter, stating her mental and health issues caused by the toxic environment as her reasons. Finally after more than two months, the position is clear and filled right away. What was just rumors, by now has become fact, parents were aware that something went on. A group of parents start to chat with Mrs. P on their online parent forum they created, and they ask her what it all was about? Mrs. P replies that Karen has resigned due to her mental issues. Kevin did try to sue the city, it went to mediation before court hearing. The mediator saw the material and strongly advised Kevin to withdraw. Kevin listened and the whole thing was forgotten for a while. Three months passed. School was doing okay, when an email from Karen landed in Mrs. P's inbox. In short dry legal language, Karen informs Mrs. P that she knows she was slandering her in public. She also has screenshots as evidence in which she claims she had mental issues, which is not true at all. Karen demand Mrs. P to apologize in public and clarify that Karen didn't have any mental issues, and her resignation was due to professional disputes. Mrs. P was shocked. She knew for a fact that Karen was, let's just say, not 100% okay up there, and she had her resignation letter to prove it, this move from Karen, was beyond stupid. Mrs. P however, did the right thing and sent the letter to the school board, asking them what they think should be done. School board just heard the words, legal actions, and freaked out. They didn't want any of this. 
They demanded Mrs. P to just apologize and let it all be gone. But Mrs. P was not willing to admit wrongdoing of anything, as she knew she did everything right. The board kept their opinion nonetheless, claiming Mrs. P as being pointlessly stubborn, and they will not cover any legal matters in this issue with Karen. Which is pointed against Mrs. P and the contract they had, all legal liability that she has within her work should be covered by her employer. That meant, her job was on the line now, but Mrs. P was determined to fight back and win. But without the city resources, fighting a slander lawsuit is expensive, and with her job at risk, it won't be easy. Mrs. P went to the parents' forum again, letting them know that she had some personal legal issues, and asked if they know who could help her. One of the parents, a lawyer, agreed to help without pay. Small side note, it is highly unprofessional to ask parents to help in personal issues, but it wasn't really a personal issue, it was the school's issue, and that lawyer's parent noted that after he was informed on the details. The lawyer agreed on that Karen and Kevin had no ground to sue, but said that if they sent the email, their intention is to sue anyway. And nothing Mrs. P would do will stop them, so it was better if Mrs. P just ignored it and let them dig their own grave. And digging they did. A week after the first letter, a new letter arrived by regular mail in an envelope. It was printed on Kevin's law firm letter, stating that this matter should be resolved by a public apology, or they will sue. Even the lawyer didn't believe someone in a large prestige law firm is that dumb, but nonetheless, the letter was there to prove it. A trial will take time and will cost money, even if he is doing it for free, not to mention that Mrs. P would be fired no matter the result. They had to find another solution. The lawyer figured out that stupid people need stupid solutions, he thought about it for a while, and then remembered he had a classmate in college who went working for that firm. He called that classmate and asked him how he is doing, now that they are both well after their college years. Apparently, his classmate worked hard and got to become a junior partner in the firm. When the lawyer mentioned the case, his friend was surprised. He hadn't heard about this case, and he should have, as lawyers in large firms gossip like old women, and especially if it's a slander suit against special education school? It's the most raunchy gossip in town. But also a PR nightmare, he, and other partners, would never take a case like this, it will make them look like greedy lawyers who would skin off anybody for a penny, not good publicity at all. He promised to look around and check what is going on in the firm. It didn't take him long, the next day he called the lawyer back. He found out no lawyer in the firm was aware of the case, he figured Kevin used the firm paper to send the letter, but no lawyer from this firm was involved. Good news for our lawyer. Together they planned the right answer to Kevin and Karen. The answer that will shut them out for good. The lawyer called Mrs. P and told her his plan. It was easy, simple and malicious. She didn't like it, but agreed to it as it was the best and fasted way to resolve the situation. Next thing the lawyer drafted his settlement agreement, he called Kevin and asked him if it will do. The agreement stated that Mrs. P will apologize to Karen in the most public way she can, and will post all the legally related papers, alongside the apology in the school webpage. The agreement stated that the apology can come in any form, as long as it can be found with Google search and has a link from the school webpage. It also stated that after the apology, Karen and Kevin will not be able to sue the school ever again and will have no further demands for Mrs. P or the school, ever again. The last clause stated that if any unrelated issues will come of this agreement, Karen and Kevin will be liable for any consequences and the school can demand any losses it suffers from them. Kevin agreed to all the terms, within two hours Karen and Kevin signed the agreement, and the next stage was ready to launch. The lawyer came to Mrs. P's office with the equipment he needed and the apology transcript. He set a video camera and Mrs. P reads her apology. She opened with an introduction, who Mrs. P is, what she had done so far in her career, her degrees and recommendation. She also made an introduction to Karen, her career so far, her degree and recommendation, which were none, so far. And after the introduction, she explained that Karen claimed that she left the school in the middle of the school year, because of a professional disagreement. Any other comment Mrs. P or anyone else have claimed about Karen's health and mental issues, were false and Mrs. P is sorry if Karen's, or anybody else who heard so, feelings were hurt. In essence, anyone who sees the video understands exactly who Karen is, and even if Mrs. P didn't say it in words, it was clear she thought very bad things about Karen. Right after it was finished, the video was uploaded to the school's YouTube channel, and a subsite under the school website was created, showing the video and all the related documents including the threatening letter Kevin sent in his firm's paper. 
a link was sent to Kevin with a short line added, that settles the matter, don't contact us ever again. Karen and Kevin had won the battle. A month passed, and Kevin suddenly got fired from his firm. Apparently he wasn't in a position to send a letter threatening with a lawsuit, especially not under the firm's paper, without any higher-up lawyer watching him. Sending it like that, for a case he managed himself, was plain fraud. He was reported to the bar, but to not let a scandal and PR disaster come out, he was just let go and no further reprimands were taken. The firm sent a letter to the school admitting the fraud, and asked the school to remove the threatening letter Kevin sent. The school graciously agreed and Kevin's letter was removed. But the firm letter, admitting Kevin's fraud was published instead. Kevin was done in the business. Any lawyer firm he went to for a job asked him, why he left the big firm before he even got past the first stage, and a simple search of his name showed he committed fraud, against a special education school from all places. Nobody would hire him. Meanwhile, Karen kept looking for a job in her field. She had to wait until a new school year would begin. Her college professor was not willing to write her any recommendation, and she had to explain the missing year in her resume to any principal. Few school principals heard she worked with Mrs. P and called her to ask about Karen, which Mrs. P only said that due to legal issues she can't talk about Karen, and it is all explained in the legal section of the school website. That was enough, any principal who knows that Karen sued her former school will not dare to hire her. Karen lost that school year, and to support herself, had to start looking for other jobs. She found a job as a secretary in an office that wouldn't Google search her name and worked there for a couple of months, until the manager got bored one day and decided to search Karen's name. She was fired the next day for a minor F up. It is more than five years since it happened. Kevin is a lawyer in a sleazy firm hired mostly by low-life criminals, he loses most of his court cases and is known as the low-life lawyer for the low-life criminal. Karen is still looking for a job. She can't hold a job for more than six months before she gets fired for petty things. They both know very well why they are doing so poorly in life. Kevin sent another threatening letter, demanding to remove all mentions of his name and Karen's from the school website. He also asked to remove the video. The lawyer just told him that it is what he agreed on, and if he wants to renegotiate, he will demand Kevin to pay for damages. He didn't specify what damages, and Kevin didn't ask, he gave up, Karen and Kevin admitted defeat. They lost the war. Mrs. P eventually removed the video from the school site, and set it as private on YouTube, but all the legal letters are still posted there, and will be there until… well maybe forever. This happened shortly after college. My mom is a retired disabled woman, who owns her house on a quiet residential cul-de-sac. She has lived there longer than anyone else. Her neighborhood has designated parking spaces at the end of the cul-de-sac, all with the addresses of each house painted in the parking space. My mom doesn't get out much, so I use her designated parking space. At the time, we lived in the same city and I visited her weekly to bring groceries, fix broken things, cook for her etc. My mom parked her car in the backyard of her house, since she went out so little. Mom kept busy by gardening or baking slash buying cookies for the children on the street. Mom's neighbor, Ivy, never parked well. Whenever I stopped by, her car was always parked so close to my car, that I had to park on the curb. I wouldn't have cared about Ivy's piss-poor parking but for two things, one, she had four or five kids and had parties almost every weekend, leaving trash in mom's yards. Two, I loved my car, a 2016 metallic ice blue Dodge Challenger Hellcat, the first car I had ever purchased brand new. I washed that car once a week, detailed the interior, and had rules against eating, drinking, or even leaving trash in my car. It was my pride and joy. Mom had called the police throughout Ivy's residence because of the parties. Ivy's guests would fill up the cul-de-sac with their cars, obstructing traffic, and get into loud, drunk fights at and after midnight. I often found empty beer bottles, empty condom wrappers, cigarette butts, and empty crack baggies on the fence between the properties, mostly on Ivy's side of the fence. This is all important information. One Saturday while having dinner at mom's house, I heard a loud crash and my car alarm went off. I ran outside, to see Ivy's older model Honda Accord back out of her parking space, and speed down the street. Ivy's Accord had a dent from the front bumper to the door, and the headlight had popped out. I approached my challenger with trepidation and screamed in anguish at what I saw. My car, my beautiful three-week-old car with less than 500 miles on it, 
had a dent stretching from the passenger's door to the front bumper, and the right front wheel was tilted at a 30-degree angle. I was livid and in anguish as I called the police, filed an online claim with my insurance, and arranged for a tow truck to take my damaged car to the dealership. The estimated cost of repairs came out to $3,400 US dollars, total cost of repairs was eventually $6,500. I had a low insurance deductible, $100, but my car was parked and Ivy owed for the damages. For two weeks, I knocked on Ivy's door or waited for her to come home. She stopped driving her damaged Accord and either rented or borrowed a Ford Fusion. When she was home, she didn't answer the door. When she wasn't, she stayed away until my rental car, a Dodge Charger, left mom's parking space. I left a note on Ivy's door for her to call me but only received harassing calls from restricted phone numbers, or people blaring air horns in my ear when I answered. Enter, vengeful brainwave. About two weeks after the accident, Ivy's children came to mom's house for some cookies. I noticed that two of them had bruises around their eyes. If Ivy hadn't hit my car, I still would have done what I did but maybe not as underhandedly. I had mom take pictures with the children, and waited until the next party to strike. Ivy had a party that night or the night after. Mom called me to let me know, and I installed an app onto my phone that gave me a fake phone number. I called it in and reported the party. There's a loud party at 1007 Mountain Drive, and I'm worried, because the children are around all these drunk adults. Please, hurry. Mom called to let me know the police had arrived. I drove to her house, stopping by the grocery store first so that appeared to be the reason, and saw Ivy and her boyfriend Bane already sitting in the back of a squad car. From a news broadcast, that night, I found out that Bain had warrants out for his arrest. Initially, the charges were disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. However, Mom turned over the photos of the children, anonymously mailing them through the post office with Ivy's address and name as the return address. Less than a week later, Ivy and Bain were charged with child abuse charges. I think Bain was charged with more severe charges as well for abusing Ivy's daughter. Either way, the children ended up in foster care, and Ivy and Bain ended up in prison. I'll think this is a fitting end. My car was hit by such a foul witch, being a pro I played a snitch. Her children had bruises, she had no excuses. My plan went well, no hitch. You stay till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. I want to take this moment, to thank you, I really appreciate you, because you bring me a great amount of joy. Subscribe for future uploads and show your vengeful devotion, by tickling the like button, without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. And I'll be seeing you, in the next one.